In the name of Jesus, who was baptized as part of his plan to fulfill all righteousness for you, for me, and for the whole world. Amen. Dear friends, isn't it frustrating? I find it frustrating at least, but isn't it frustrating when you're not able to get everything done in a week that you want to get done? There's always something that you should have been, that you should have done, but you just didn't seem to have time to do it. Life is a juggling act, and you're always dropping something. You have to work. You want to spend time with your family. You're supposed to find time for exercise. You're supposed to keep up your home. You would like to be a good neighbor and perhaps get involved in your community. You know that God wants you to spend time in his word and in prayer. And somewhere in all of that, you're supposed to find time for rest and relaxation. And when you look back at the day or week behind, you find that there's something you just forgot to do. Isn't that always the case? Isn't it frustrating? There's always one more phone call that you should have made or another person that you should have visited or another event that you should have attended, another errand you should have run, who has time for it all? Trying to do everything is like coming home with 10 bags of groceries and then trying to fit them all on a TV tray. It doesn't all fit. The same thing is true about life and about Christianity. As Christians, there's so much more that we would like to do and that we really ought to do for God. But how do you do it all? We all want to glorify him. We all want to grow in our understanding of his word and our understanding of his will for our lives. We all would like to become more and more Christ-like in our lives. We all would like to witness more, but once again, who has time for it all? Who has the ability to do it all? And to do it all well. It's easy as Christians to look back at our lives and to feel pressure to do more. And then you feel guilty because you didn't do enough or you didn't do it well. This morning we're going to look at a moment in the life of Jesus and see how that moment can bring you and me a great deal of comfort and encouragement in our lives as Christians. Thank God that Jesus, our Savior, came, and he came to do it all. And he came to do it all well. It must have been very surprising for John the Baptist to see Jesus coming around the corner. It must have been very surprising Strange and surprising for John to see Jesus. It was a normal day for John the Baptist as he did his work, preaching and baptizing, and then Jesus arrived. From John's point of view, Jesus didn't need to be baptized. After all, he was the Son of God. He was the Christ, the anointed one. He was without sin. What did he need to be baptized for? John even said to Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? If anyone needs to be baptized, John said, It was me. 
I'm the sinner. I'm the one that needs salvation. Why don't you baptize me, Jesus? But in verse 15, listen how Jesus answers. He says, let it be so now. It is proper to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John agreed. John didn't realize what a big moment this was in God's plan of salvation. Jesus' baptism was the official beginning of his public ministry and his public work on behalf of all mankind. Before his baptism, Jesus lived privately. He kept a low profile. He wasn't out preaching and teaching yet. He hadn't been out arguing with the Pharisees, performing miracles. But now the time had come to do his work and his baptism marked that beginning. And what a great way to begin his ministry. For here Jesus received what he wanted every Christian to receive. That is baptism. Jesus started his ministry by saying, I am one of you. I am human like you. I live on this earth like you. And now I have been baptized like you. Jesus identifies with you. He was baptized like you. And notice how Jesus describes his baptism. He says, it is proper to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, if you can think of all the righteous things that God wants people to do while they're on this earth, Jesus says, I have come to do that too. Which includes being baptized. Just think of all the things that Jesus would have to do over the next three years to fulfill all righteousness. He could not leave any stone unturned. He would have to be a man of prayer and to do that perfectly. He would have to be a man of love. And he did that too. As we see from the way that he treated his disciples and the crowds as they followed him. He would have to be a man of humble service and we see that in his healing and in his teaching. He would have to be a man of sacrifice and we see that as he gave up everything, even his own life, to pay for the sins of all mankind. And he would have to do all those things perfectly, flawlessly. He would have to do it all. He couldn't leave anything unfinished for he had come to fulfill all righteousness. Pretty tough job description if you ask me. Where did Jesus, the man, the human being, the one who says I'm like you, get the strength. He finds that strength in his baptism. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descend on him like a dove. Every time baptism takes place, the Spirit of God descends on a person. At your baptism, the Spirit of God descended on you in an invisible way. We use water because it helps us visualize that invisible property of the Holy Spirit. And that's when the Holy Spirit changes you and causes you to be reborn, as we heard in our Romans 6 passage, to be reborn. At Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit came in a visible way. 
in the form of a dove. Now, Jesus didn't need to be reborn as we do. But Jesus, the man, the human, needed strength. For he had come to do it all. It's the savior of the world, and that was no small task. The Holy Spirit descended on him to equip him with strength and with determination, with intensity and resolve to be the savior of mankind. Three years worth of strength was given to Christ at his baptism. So he was able to do it all, to glorify his heavenly father the way he did. And that's when God the Father spoke. You see, God the Father could see the future. He could see what Jesus would do over the next three years. He could see whether or not Jesus would be able to do it all. The praying, the acts of love, the teaching, the serving, the humility, the suffering for the sins of all mankind. God could see the future. He could see what Jesus would do and listen to the grade that he gives his son. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. He will do it all, the father said, and he will do it all very well. What a great beginning to Jesus' public ministry. He identifies with you. He gets strengthened by the Holy Spirit. He receives approval from the Father, and now he begins his work. And I think this is a great source of comfort and encouragement. Do you know why? It's because you and I could never do it all. No matter how hard we try, we can't be perfect people of prayer. No matter how hard we try, we can't be people who are always perfectly growing in our relationship with God. We can't be people who are always loving and serving others. We can't be people who are always perfectly witnessing our faith. We just can't do it all. When you take those spiritual things and then try to combine them with the pressure of everyday life, working and family and taking care of your home and being a good neighbor and everything else in between and try to do it all perfectly, we just can't. Jesus came to do what you could not. Jesus says to you, I love you too much. I love you too much to let you be punished for the things that you didn't do in your life. I love you too much to allow you to be punished for the things that you did do. And because I love you so much, I will come and I will do it for you. I will fulfill all righteousness. I will be your substitute. I will give you the credit and take the punishment. This means, dear friends, that the pressure is off. The weight has been taken off our shoulders. You don't have to feel afraid that you haven't done enough to please God in your life. You don't have to feel the sense of despair because it's too hard to do it all. You don't have to feel the guilt that you haven't done enough for God. Jesus has done it all. And he's done it all for you. You are a forgiven child of God because of Jesus. Have faith in him. And when God sees you, he doesn't see a sinner who hasn't done enough. 
He sees a Christian who has been made righteous by Christ, who has done everything for you. This is what gives us strength and motivation to live godly lives. At our baptism, God gave you his spirit, and at your baptism, God gave you the strength and desire and ability to serve him, to glorify him with your life. You'll never be able to do it all. But God has set you free to do as much as you can to please God to serve him, to witness about him with your gifts and your abilities. May God bless you as you use your life to glorify the one who has done it all for you. In Jesus' name, amen.